Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin smith Tonight, more troops are sent into the turbulent areas of Darfur after days of clashes between Arab and Masalit fighters cost more than 175 lives. Rights organizations say that communities ha that have suffered months of unrest are more vulnerable than ever. Also, as South Africa pledges more money to flood stricken communities to rebuild, President Ramaphosa says that there'll be real-time audits of the money and that he's embarrassed at how much worry there is about how much of the funding might be stolen. And pigeon peas take off in Madagascar as an NGO tries to help farmers turn to hardier crops that can resist the drought that's seen traditional staples fail. But first, in Sudan, after days of deadly clashes in West Darfur province, the military sent in more troops. More than 175 people have been killed in fighting between Arab and Masalit communities. The UN said that more has to be done to protect civilians and urged that a joint military force be quickly created as set out in a peace deal that was signed between the government and rebels in October 2020, fighting in the town of Krynik eventually spread to the provincial capital of Jenena. The violence has forced food agency agencies to suspend distributions, healthcare workers to be evacuated and seen a local hospital destroyed. Mathilde Vu from the Norwegian Refugee Council recently returned to Khartoum from Jenena. I think, as you rightly described, uh, we've seen an escalation of uh, violence, especially since Friday, and especially in the town of Krinik and also in Algenina. Um, we have reports of uh, people killed, people wounded, houses burned down, the market burned down, the, uh, the hospital being attacked, all this in, in Krinik, and 10,000 of people have had to run for their lives and try and find safety wherever they could inside the city. Um, to your question of like uh, what, what sparks this, it's, it's really complex, but I, I mean, you know, we haven't heard about Darfur for more than a decade, right? And uh, But that doesn't mean that the region was, was at peace, uh, I think quite the contrary. And despite the commitments and despite the plans, the drivers of conflict still exist and they've been really exacerbated over these past uh, two years. Um, the issue of distribution of land and resources, the topic of justice, the topic of impunity, none of those have been completely addressed. And so they are all contributing to, to the violence that we're seeing today. So as you mentioned there, many of, of those affected uh, in this latest cycle have been hit again and again by prior violence. Uh, how how are they coping with this this latest bout? Oh, they're not. Uh, they're not coping. You know, what's really distressing is that the vast majority of those people who have been on the fire over the, the past five days. It's not their first time. And when we talk to people, they're, they're traumatized. Not because of the, not only because of the attack that just happened, what happened in the past, but also because they know that it can happen again. You know, in clinic, for example, the displaced communities that were attacked, they were attacked also in December. Their house were burned in December. They also had to flee in December. They tried to rebuild. And then once again, five days ago, they lost everything again. So I don't think, they, I don't think they're coping. They're coping, sorry. So is this latest chapter of, of what's uh, been, been happening, that, that's actually the latest of, of months of escalating clashes around Darfur, um, not just West Darfur, but also the neighboring states of North and South Darfur. Any, are there any signs of this instability resolving anytime soon? I'm afraid I don't have uh, I don't have good uh, good news. I mean, even if today in Algenina, at least and in Krinik, we've heard that uh, the fighting had, had slowed down, but that doesn't mean that uh, the crisis is over. I mean, you know what's really important to remember is that um, it goes far beyond the uh, the direct uh, impact. Sorry, of an attack. It goes beyond the number of people dead. It goes beyond the number of people wounded. So about also the number of people who survive. You know, and who will be displaced for for months, if not years. And so when I was in Algenina last week, I talked to people who had been displaced a year ago, and they were still struggling to survive today. You know, they were living on the makeshift shelters, on the rugs. They had barely enough food to feed their family. They couldn't send their kids to school. There was no protection, no security. They couldn't really go out to, to go and travel, and travel, sorry, and work as well. And, you know, the, the UN is saying that in September, we're heading towards a major food crisis. I think they say 18 million people are likely to be food insecure. 
because of an economic crisis, because of poor harvest, but it's also because of conflict. So in places like Darfur, if people cannot go to their farm because of insecurity and because of conflict, they can't harvest, they lose their means of livelihood, and then they can't they can't feed their family. So I'm afraid that even if this specific attack settles down, we'll still be faced with a major humanitarian crisis, and that deserves way more attention uh, that it's receiving right now. Matilde Vu there from the Norwegian Refugee Council speaking to me a little earlier on. Now, a second person has died of Ebola in northwestern DR Congo. It comes days after the emergence of a fresh outbreak of the disease, and the 25-year-old patient who died was the sister-in-law of the first case. Now, he began showing symptoms on April 5th, was eventually admitted to a medical centre in Bandaka in Ecuador province, and died on April 21st. The WHO says that the original transmission may have come from an infected animal. At least 145 people came into contact with the confirmed cases, and they're currently being monitored. On Tuesday, in setting out his plans to help the parts of South Africa that have been rocked by deadly floods, President Cyril Ramaphosa said that it was a shame at how much of the debate was around the likelihood that resources would be stolen or squandered. Ramaphosa told Parliament that people have become tired of corruption and said that oversight of the flood relief funds would be thorough and include real-time audits. At least 435 people were killed and dozens are still missing after the devastating floods and mudslides that rocked KwaZulu-Natal earlier this month. Nadine Theron tells us more about Ramaphosa's plans. First thing he did was uh, he had uh, National Treasury released uh, 1 billion rand immediately. Uh, that was um, about a week ago. And now more funding will be mobilized through the, the f fact that he declared a national state of disaster. Um, that's in terms of the funding. And he already said um, on Thursday that this won't be enough and, and we will need more funding to rebuild and recover. The biggest uh, priority at the moment is providing shelter to the more than 14,000 households who have been left homeless in KwaZulu-Natal. So the government is currently building some temporary shelters. They've also provided um, repair vouchers for some people to repair their houses. And they've identified land parcels um, where new uh, temporary shelters can be built. But Ramaphosa said that, you know, the humanitarian relief in terms of accommodation has not been adequate and that people must be moved with greater speed to temporary accommodation um, as the wind Winter is starting um, to sweep over South Africa, not only in the form of those floods, but it is becoming colder. And um, that's been the priority. The government has also provided social relief grants, um, including food vouchers for affected families and burial vouchers, as well as vouchers for school uniforms. But those are all once off just for this month. After that, people will kind of be on their own. Well, Ramaphosa has also tackled the question of, of potential looting of relief funding. He did that pretty head on. What did he have to say? Well, yes, and that's, of course, after the Special Investigations Unit found that more than 8 billion rand was spent irregularly on COVID-19-related government procurement, and 62% of those procurement processes were irregular. So this time around, as you said, they will be, they will be conducting um, audits throughout in real time to make sure there's no wastage or fraud, and Treasury will also be strengthening its reporting requirements, and it will be publishing the details of all the disaster-related procurement by public institutions on the Treasury's website so the pub public can scrutinize it at all times. He's also established an ad hoc joint committee consisting of 20 um, government officials who have been tasked to oversee the disaster response, and they are going to report back in November. They're supposed to monitor it. But, you know, despite this, opposition parties have openly expressed their distrust um, in uh, Ramaphosa's efforts to curb disaster. And some said that they don't trust Ramaphosa will keep these promises of keeping out corruption because he has been making these promises for years and, and he failed to keep them during the COVID-19 pandemic. Nadine, there are there for us. Now, in southern Madagascar, a local NGO is encouraging farmers to switch to farming pigeon peas. Now, they don't need much water to grow and could help with food shortages caused by drought. Noha Berstecker tells us more. Kazi Zanapijo had long struggled to grow edible crops in the arid fields stretching across southern Madagascar. 
For years, the mother of 10 had to eat cactus and wild plants to survive. But since switching to pigeon peas, a drought-resistant vegetable, she's been able to make ends meet. I used to plant other crops, but they didn't grow. Since I started planting pigeon peas, I've harvested a lot. It's what allows me to feed my 10 children. The thin, shrub-like plant requires little water to grow. It's also highly nutritious and good for the soil, and is already a staple in India and other Asian countries. In Madagascar, the culture of pigeon peas is being promoted by a local NGO, which provides seeds and training to a handful of farmers. Others, like Zanapijo, simply began emulating their neighbors after seeing their successful harvests. They probably saw a plot nearby with pigeon peas and realized it was working well, that the soil wasn't being blown away by the wind. They realized they could earn good money with it, so they studied the techniques and tried to copy them. The resilient crop also yields thin branches that can be sold as firewood at the market. Since switching to pigeon peas, Zanapijo says she managed to save enough money to build a rainwater reservoir for her entire village. Well, that's it for Eye in Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care. Across Europe, far-right parties are increasingly attracting young voters. Und ich glaube, dass das ganz ausschlaggebend ist, warum man die AfD so verteufelt, weil wir die einzige Opposition sind. Be they long-time activists, disillusioned by their governments, or defenders of national traditions, these are the new faces of the extreme right. Fredo è un partito chiaramente di destra, è moderna, una destra che è in grado di, di governare, di andare al governo dell'Italia. Noi, in primo luogo, appoggiamo a lavorare perché crediamo che è giusto. Pero es obvio que, que también tenemos intención de que este gobierno eh, no ocupe el poder ni un segundo más. Watch reporters on France 24 and France24.com.